scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts on page 122 of your few Bibles, also known at times as the fifth gospel. We'll be reading from fourth chapter, verses 5 through 12. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Ananias the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. So be the gospel read this morning. Indeed, it was said some years ago that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock tends to be the most segregated hour of the week. But here at Northwood, you're turning that most segregated hour to the most sacred hour. So it's just good to be here. Thank the brother for the reading of the scripture. And I'm just going to lift up uh, another portion of that pericope. In it. it says there in the seventh verse, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power 
or by what name have you done this? By what power? By what name? I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, blame it on Jesus, or a simple answer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this moment in time. I pray, Almighty God, that you would allow me to decrease so that you might increase, that these, your loving people, may see less and less of me, but more and more of thee. For we are thirsty and hungry for something this world cannot supply. Be with us, Lord, for we need a word from you. We ask this in the master's power of your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Blame it on Jesus. August Wilson, as a part of his 10-play cycle, writes one of the plays centered there in the 1920s. Depression is going on in the United States. And in the midst of the depression, and there's a music form that comes to rise called the blues that play that August Wilson pens is called Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And in it, she has, he has a scene. I was privileged some years ago to catch it on Broadway with Whoopi Goldberg playing the lead role and Charles Dutton playing a member of the band by the name of Levy. And Charles Dutton, Levy, engaged in the conversation about faith and religion and who knew the Lord and who didn't know the Lord and who knew the Bible, who didn't know the Bible. They began the discussion and the one band member told Charles Dutton that I know the Lord's Prayer. Having seen how he spent his nights, Charles Dutton's character said, you don't know the Lord's Prayer. He said, I bet you $50 I know the Lord's Prayer. You'll bet me $50, you know the Lord's Prayer with the ear on. Let me hear it. He said, all right then. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He said, oh, I didn't know you knew it. Here's your $50. <laughs> Those of you who are laughing know that indeed that was not the Lord's Prayer. But sometimes I'm of the mindset that it's not that we have to memorize certain aspects of religion, of faith, and the culture. Because there are some people who would trivialize it. The main thing, the important thing, is that somehow, somewhere, we come to know the Lord. We come to know that no matter what we're going through, that there is an exit ramp in life. That there's nothing and no burden that can come our way that we can not bear. And whereas both individuals in that particular story we're not able to pinpoint and precisely state the Lord's Prayer. One thing is certain that they need to know and that you need to know. And that is when trouble comes knocking at your door, where can you turn to? It was the philosopher who stated Karl Marx that opiate, that religion is the opiate of the poor. He was right. But he was wrong. For when he hurled that remark, he was trying to say that those at the bottom of society clung needlessly to the idea of faith, religion, and God. But anyone present here who's had on the downside of life, anyone here who's had to suffer with more month than money, when your change was strange, Anyone here who knows about climbing up the rough side of the mountain and, and hitting rock bottom knows something about having opportunities cut off from you and having options for where to turn cut off. But it was Les Brown who said that if you fall down on your back, look up. Because if you can look up, you can get up. In our passage this morning, what has occurred here is there's a beggar lying outside of the gate called Beautiful. He's there and he's been laying there for quite some time. 
And then in the midst of his circumstance and condition come Peter and John. He had heard something about these individuals perhaps and he asked them for some alms and knowing that perhaps that he would, they would reach down not only in their wallets but in the generosity of their hearts, their souls and their salvation would give him a little relief in the form of some money. But they patted their pockets, the breast pocket, and said, silver and gold, have I none? But then a light bulb goes off. But ah, such that I have, we give unto you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And somehow, some way, that foot bone connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone connected to the thigh bone, and the thigh bone connected to the west bone, and he got up. He got up. Like that great getting up morning. He got up. He who was lame for quite some time got a power. And you know what happens. When folk find that there's something going on, they began to make their way. But not only do they make their way, they began to tell the story to who would listen. And so it was that the word had gone about and it made its way to the ears of certain individuals in society. That being the political, right, the religious leaders. And although they had their own grievances, um, they came together. That's a uh-oh moment. I read in scripture that the religious leaders and political leaders came together. I said, uh-oh, there's something going on here. Decided to bring Peter and John together and, and attempt to go ahead and convene the grand jury and they asked this question to them. By whose name is it that you're able to do these things? By what power and by what name? That's how the King James Version puts it. But allow me to give you the Thomas Bowen bootleg edition translation. Who do you think you are? coming in here, um, giving, giving, giving health care and healing without a copay. Who do you think you are? Who named you president of and secretary of health and human services around these parts? Who do you think you are? And this question was a setup. For we know that they were not trying to find a way to continue that which had been done. But then the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon um, Peter. And you need to realize this, because there's a scene before that when Jesus is talking about the day that he would betray. And Peter swears the oath that he'd be with Jesus to the end. But Jesus says, by the time the, the cock crows thrice, you would have betrayed me. Peter didn't believe it then. But then when the ships had fallen and the stuff that I can't say from this pulpit had hit the fan, <laughs> indeed the cock crowed and Peter had denied Jesus. But here is Peter with another chance. Isn't it good to serve a God of another chance? He failed the first assignment, but here he has the opportunity to do it again. But he doesn't do it by himself. It's experience going back, and he has the power of the Holy Spirit on his side. So Reverend James Leary he told me something some years ago in the study. They said that some folk get it wrong. The Holy Spirit doesn't cause you to shout. It doesn't cause you to run up and down the aisle. What the Holy Spirit does is bring to remembrance the things that God has done for you. And when you recall what God has done for you, Perhaps you can't help but shout or to shed a tear and have a response. But Peter stands to the fore. He says, you want to know how it is we're able to do this healing? You want to know how we're able to do this? Is that man that you crucified on the cross at Calvary. It's in his name that man is able to walk. He just simply... Blamed it on Jesus. I'm so glad that Pastor Liz congratulated me and thanked me for 
connecting her with Matt, and she didn't blame me. <laughs> but if she had blamed me, I said, you're very kindly welcomed. And here, Peter puts it all on Jesus. And there's some situations in your life, there's some things that God has brought you through that people may not understand. Who are you to think that you can marry who you want to marry? Blame it on Jesus. Who is you to think that you have a right to raise your voice to the political discussions? Blame it on Jesus. Who are you? to tell me what we can and cannot do as police officers. Blame it on Jesus. Who are you to say that we ought not racially profile young black males? Blame it on Jesus. For in Jesus there's no east, there's no west. There's no rich and there's no poor, there's no gay and there's no straight, there's no black and there's no white. Blame it on Jesus. And I just stopped by here from Washington, D.C. to tell somebody I put the blame on Jesus. People in Baltimore are going to the streets today. Blame it on Jesus for they understand that they are made in the Imago Day, as Martin Buber says, in the very image of God. We're all God's children. Just different heights and, and different accents. We're all God's children. We're all precious in God's sight. So it was in my own tradition, that which Cornell West calls the grand and great tradition, that my forebearers and my ancestors have been able to withstand everything that's come their way. They may not have gotten it right in terms of being able to pinpoint and to properly recite scriptures and passages of the Bible, but they got it right when they realized that the Lord will make a way somehow. And that's what Langston Hughes tried to explain in that poem, Mother to Son, well you know, son, life for me ain't been no crystal stairs, it had holes in it and places bare, and all the while I was still climbing, and why is she still climbing? Blame it on Jesus. She understood that the Lord had not brought her this far to leave her, she did not come this far to turn around. Blame it on Jesus. What James Weldon Johnson sought to do when he penned the African-American national anthem, God of our weary years and God of our silence years, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, he blamed it on Jesus. And you here today, you have a power that will blow folk mind. You have a strength, you have a fortitude, you have a dignity that the world can not destroy. Who are you not to think you are great? Who are you not to think or be told by someone that God doesn't love you? Who are you not to believe that the Lord will make a way out of no way? God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. There was a very wealthy woman who lived in a very large house and she didn't have any family to speak of. She just had someone who become a very close companion to her. But she decided, based upon how the Lord had blessed her so mightily, that she wanted to do something for someone else. So she told her companion to go into the streets and to get her a dog. But she didn't want any kind of dog. She wanted a mutt. She didn't want the kind of dog I would want, a chocolate labradoodle. She told her the pain to go get her a mutt. Tried to caution and warn her that you don't want a mutt. A, a mutt's not used to the fine things that you have here. You, you want another dog. You want a dog with some pedigrees. She said, no, I, I want a mutt. She hopped in the car and went riding throughout the neighborhood. And she saw two dogs engaged in a battle and some other dogs were helping the dogs to overpower and overcome the one dog and then they, they ran off as a pack and the dog that was beat up and broken and bruised, that's the one that decided to pick up and carry back to the house. And brought in the house, bleeding all over uh, the place and laid the dog on the floor and said, here's the dog you want. 
She looked at the dog and immediately called the veterinarian. The veterinarian came and worked on the doc dog for about an hour or so and patched the dog up and stopped the bleeding and said with a little bit more care the dog might make it. And after she had paid the vet, told her companion to go ahead and give the dog a bath and put the dog in the bathtub and turned on the jacuzzi. Gave a pillow for the dog to lean the head back and gave the dog a, a manicure and a pedicure. That's a mani and a pedic. Uh, in on the water, poured some Chanel number no. five into the water, tried to sweeten it up a little bit, and brought the dog out of the water after I scrubbed the dog and gave him a, a towel dry. And then around that time, it was time to eat. So they brought the dog to the table. Didn't put a bowl on the floor, put a plate on the table, and had the dog to eat from the table. And after the dog had eaten, decided to put the dog to bed and had a nice bed laid out for the dog with a high thread count and put the dog in there and gave the dog a mask to put over the dog's eyes and laid the dog down there on that pillow with some silk covering. And read the dog a nice bedtime story from the 23rd song and sang a lullaby to the dog and closed the door and left. Next morning went to wake the dog up and lo and behold, the dog was gone. Panion told uh, the lady that I, I told you the dog wouldn't appreciate, it didn't take any time. The dog is already going to break your heart. And as she was in the middle of I told you so, there was a knock at the door. And lo and behold, who was at the door? It was the dog. But the dog wasn't alone. Had some other dogs <laughs> with the even some of the dogs that had beaten the, beaten the dog a day before. And someone got the videotape from the corner down the street. And lo and behold, there was that dog had turned over a milk crate and was standing on the milk crate, telling folk as they turned the volume up, if, if, if you're hungry, I, I know a woman. Um, if you're beaten and bruised, then I, I know a woman. If you need someone to be patient and kind and show some love to you, then I know a woman. And I've come by Northwood to tell somebody I know a woman. I know somebody who's able to keep you from falling and to present you falsely before the throne. I know somebody who'll be better to you than you've been to yourself. I know somebody. Somebody was born in a manger and walked the dusty roads of Palestine, healed the brokenhearted, the blind, raised up Lazarus from the grave, went, went through a kangaroo court, was sentenced to die on the cross at Calvary, hung there all day Friday, contemplated life and eternity on Saturday. Then early one Sunday morning, while the dew was still on the roads, became a maid and made up his dying bed. I had a conversation with death and wrote a, a poem to death. Death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is that victory? And got up with all power in his hands. When you reach those desperate situations in your life, it's because he died and because he's coming again that you have power from high. You can blame it on Jesus and meet each and every day that the Lord sends someone who knew you back then, looks at you and says, who do you think you are? By what power? How are you able to do these things? Then tell them, let me tell you about a baby. Tell them because some 2,000 plus years ago, they crucified Jesus on the cross. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow.